it goes way beyond reason. It is about committing yourself to Jesus as Lord, and it's about trusting him for forgiveness and then for everything else in life. Father God, as we turn again to the book of Acts, please equip and embolden us to share the gospel as we see it shared in this part of the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Do take a seat. Some time back, a book came out with the title Explaining Your Faith Without Losing Your Friends. And it struck a real chord because you don't have to be a Christian for very long to get negative reactions to your faith. Uh, For example, I came to faith at a boarding school and pretty much as soon as that became known, I remember having insulting messages scrawled on my study door. Whenever I went to the Christian Union, I heard cries of God squad behind me from my mates. And none of us wants to be on the receiving end of that. And we would love it if there was a way of sharing our faith that guaranteed no negative reactions at all, but there isn't. The only way to stop negative reactions is to stop sharing the gospel. That's the constant temptation. And one reason why God inspired the book of Acts was to encourage us to keep sharing the gospel despite that temptation. So we are returning to a series in Acts from this time a year ago. So could you turn in the Bibles to page 1113, um, that passage that Brian read for us uh, earlier? Acts chapter 17 on page 1113. And um, would you also turn to page 8 or the back of the service sheet where there's an outline to follow and, as usual, space to jot down what most strikes you, what you most need to take away from God's Word, which I always recommend doing. So ideally, you want a Bible, an outline, a pen, a willing spirit, and a mobile that's switched to silent. Now, Acts is the sequel to Luke's Gospel. So putting them side by side, Luke's Gospel covers everything from the birth of Jesus through to his death, his resurrection from the dead, and then his return to heaven. Acts then picks up from there, and it tells about how the risen Lord Jesus goes about calling more and more people into relationship with himself. Not by the kind of divine megaphone from heaven, like people are hearing direct voices, but as... Christians share the gospel with more people. So Acts is about the worldwide spread of the gospel and of faith in Jesus. And it's about how nothing can stop that because the risen Lord Jesus is ultimately driving it. But that doesn't mean nothing can oppose it. And Acts is also about the opposition and the threats to the gospel. It's about the negative reactions to Jesus, as well as the positive ones, so that we are equipped for everything we are going to have to face in sharing the gospel. And as we rejoin at chapter 17, we find that the people who react most negatively are the ones with a Bible background who think they're already okay. We're going to look at verses 1 to 9, and they teach three main lessons. Number one, Jesus' death and resurrection should be the center of our message. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. When they, that is the Apostle Paul and Silas, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue. So in a new place, Paul always went first to his fellow Jews. That was because God had already been dealing with them. So he had given them the Old Testament, which pointed forward to Jesus. So they were the obvious place to start. And our sharing of the gospel will start with people like that as well. For example, in the leaflet about our Christianity Explored course, there are quotes from people who've been on it, and one of them says this, I'd fallen out of Christian things for many years, but Christianity Explored helped me see what it really means to be a Christian. So that's a Christian background person. So we want to be reaching people who've heard absolutely nothing about Jesus. And praise God we are, especially through our international ministry. But we equally want to be helping people 
who are Christian background people, who are still saying, I'm still trying to sort out whether I really believe it for myself. So verse 2, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, which at that point was just the Old Testament, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Now, Paul was talking to Jews who accepted the Old Testament, and you and I don't have that kind of common ground with the people we're trying to share the gospel with. But let's follow through what Paul does, and then we'll ask what we can learn. So his step one was to argue that the Old Testament said that Christ had to suffer and then rise from the dead. And before Jesus, no Jew had ever thought that. What the Jews were expecting was a Christ who would be a victorious military leader, who would come in power, who would defeat their enemies, who by Jesus' day were the Romans, and who would restore the kingdom of Israel as in the good old days. In other words, they thought, we are okay. The problem is out there with those godless Gentiles, and we need the Christ to come and deal with them out there. That's pretty much what Paul would have thought before coming to faith in Jesus, and not in a million years would he have thought that the Christ would end up dying on a cross in apparent weakness and defeat. And when the first Christians started saying that he had done, Paul started persecuting them to death. But as we saw back in Acts chapter 9, on one of those persecution trips, the resurrected Lord Jesus appeared to Paul, and in that instant, Paul realized that the Jesus who had died on the cross was, in fact, the divine Christ. And all his expectations of what the Christ were going to do were overturned or had to be overturned. And so Paul went back into the Old Testament, guided by his newfound faith in Christ, to discover what it really had been saying. And he discovered that the Christ was not going to bring in the earthly kingdom of Israel all over again, but a new kingdom beyond the end of time. And, most important of all, he discovered that in order to secure any of us a place in that kingdom, he was going to have to suffer and then rise. Just keep a finger or something else in Acts 17 and turn back in the Bibles to page 740. Page 740 which coincidentally is the date before Jesus at which Isaiah's ministry began. So 740 pages before, uh, into the Bible, 740 years before Jesus. This is the prophecy of Isaiah. And in, in Isaiah 52 and 53 that Susanna read to us earlier, you get this prophecy about God's servant. And no one before Jesus had ever read this as referring to the Christ. But Jesus taught that it did. And can you imagine what it was like for Jesus to grow into a mature understanding of this chapter, knowing that it was talking about him and how his life would pan out? Look down to Isaiah 52, verse 13. This is God speaking through Isaiah, and he says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. In other words, at the end of his career, this servant is ultimately going to finish in the same position as God. That's what that's saying. Then look on to chapter 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. So Isaiah now begins begins to describe this servant's future career, future with reference to Isaiah, in, in the past tense, as if it's already happened. And here he's become a man and he's suffered. Why? Skip down to verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we have been healed. So he suffers death to take the punishment for our sins so that we can be forgiven and at peace with God again. And then look on to verse 11. After the suffering of his soul, 
He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge or by knowledge of him, my righteous servant will justify many. So everyone here, our careers are going to be ended by death. It's more true to say that this servant's career was kicked off by his death. It carried on after his death. He lives again, and on the basis of his death, he puts many, many people right with God. That's one of the passages that totally changed Paul's expectation of what the Christ was going to do. And it made him realize that he and his fellow Jews were not okay. That the problem was not just out there with those godless Gentiles, but that underneath all their Bible knowledge, all their efforts to be different from those godless Gentiles, they were as sinful as the next man or woman. And the Christ had to die for their forgiveness as much as anyone else's. So back to Acts chapter 17 on page 1113. Step number one was to argue that the Old Testament says the Christ is going to have to suffer and then rise. Step number two was to argue that's exactly what Jesus has just done. Step number three is to say, so Jesus is that Christ. Now, as I said, we are generally not sharing the gospel with Jews. So what can we learn from this? Well, one thing is to do exactly that if you are talking with a Jewish friend. Another thing is that with Christian background people, we especially need to talk about Jesus and the cross. Because like these Jews, Christian background people often have a pretty good knowledge of some of the Bible. But what they haven't seen is that the whole thing points to Jesus and his cross. So the classic thing that Christian background think is that the Bible is just a how-to-live book. Um, It's the Ten Commandments. It's love your neighbor as yourself. It's just morality. Um, And some preachers give that impression. So I've heard the Bible waved and people say, these are the maker's instructions. That's a totally misleading description of the Bible. Because first and foremost, it's not a book about how we should live. It's a book about God and God having done everything that had to be done to forgive us back into relationship with himself. And seeing that makes all the difference in the world. So back at that boarding school where I came to faith, it was my first brush with Christianity. Uh, That was through the school chapel. Uh, Most of what I heard was watered down Christianity. Most of it was just morality. And so for two years or more, I thought that the Bible was just a how to live book and I tried to live it and I failed. And I ended up feeling more distant from God, if he was even there, than I had coming from a totally non-Christian background. And maybe that's where a Christian background has left you. Because you've never really twigged that the Bible is, first and foremost, not a book about what you should do for God. It is a book about what God has done for you. To forgive and accept you just as you are, and to keep on forgiving and accepting you just as you are for the rest of your life until he takes you to be with him in his kingdom. And when I finally twigged that, it changed everything. So don't assume that a Christian background person has understood and trusted in Jesus and his cross. As with me, that is often the missing piece of the puzzle. Another thing to learn is that we can only understand Jesus and explain him to others against the background of the Old Testament, which is what Paul did here. Now, he was talking to Jews who knew their Old Testament inside out, whereas Almost all of us, I guess, come to faith in Jesus through the New Testament with much less knowledge or even no knowledge of the Old Testament. And a really important part of the Christian life is then to get to know the Old Testament better because that is how you get to know Jesus better. Take the simple statement, for example, of faith, Jesus died for my sins. That's what any Christian is able to say. But what are sins? You've got to go back to the Old Testament. You've got to go back to Genesis chapter 3 
and the original human pair rebelling against God. You've got to go back to Exodus to see God beginning to talk about himself as holy and talking about us falling short and so on. And what does it mean that Jesus died for my sins? Well, again, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. You've got to go back to the sacrifices that God provided to get into our heads the idea that a substitute can take the judgment I deserve instead of me. So can I say, even if it seems harder going, please don't avoid the Old Testament. Don't groan inwardly uh, when your Bible reading notes or the next sermon series take you back into the Old Testament. The only way you're going to get to know Jesus better is to get to know the Old Testament better. And equally, when you're explaining the gospel, you often have to go back to the Old Testament. And uh, the classic example, in my experience, is is Leading Christianity Explored, which is based on Mark's gospel. So there you are thinking, uh, we want people to look at Jesus, so we're going to keep it simple, and we're just going to look at Mark's gospel. In fact, we're going to take Mark's gospel out of the Bible for them and give it to them, keep it simple. Uh, we're We're not going to get dragged into the Old Testament or anything like that. And the group begins to read at Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And someone in your group says, excuse me, what does Christ mean? And eight words into Mark's gospel, you're going to have to understand the Old Testament to explain the New Testament. The other thing from this first bit of the passage is that the tie-up between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament events is really faith-strengthening. I hope that if you're a believer here tonight, you found that quick dip into Isaiah 53 faith-strengthening, compelling. It is extraordinary to see the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection foretold there, 700 years before they happened. And that is part of the evidence that God, who knows the end from the beginning, stands behind the whole Bible. Okay, on to the second main lesson. Number two, our evangelism should use reason and persuasion. And evangelism is just Christian speak for communicating the gospel. So just look back to verse two to see how Paul went about it. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said, and some of the Jews were persuaded. So he reasoned with them. Literally, that that says discussed with them, and that's one of the brilliant things about Christianity Explored, that in those small groups you can ask, question, challenge, doubt, anything. That's the name of the game. And then he explained and proved and persuaded. Now, um, Richard Dawkins, God Delusion and all that, has caricatured Christian faith regularly as like believing that there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. Uh, He says it's the kind of thing that there is no evidence to believe. You believe it because your parents did or because you have some psychological need. He says, quote, faith is the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence, that is rubbish, at least if you're talking about Christian faith. Christian belief isn't faith in spite of lack of evidence. It is faith based on evidence. So I don't believe in God because my parents do. Sadly, they don't. One's an agnostic, one's an atheist. Nor do I believe in God just because of some psychological need. I believe in God because I'm persuaded he's been here in person 2,000 years ago in Jesus. And I believe that because of the evidence of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and ultimately the rest of the Bible. And if you're not yet convinced about the Christian faith, I think I can give you very good arguments, for example, about why the four Gospels are reliable. We can talk about who wrote them and when, and whether they're trustworthy even though they're biased. In fact, I've written up those issues in this little booklet called uh, Why Trust Them, which is on the welcome desk. I think I can give you good arguments, for example, that Jesus really did rise from the dead, that that's the only plausible explanation for the explosive growth and survival and flourishing of the church, giving good grounds for believing that he wasn't just one of us, but was God become one of us 
So we can argue for the truthfulness of the, Bi of, of the gospel and of the Bible. We can't argue people into trusting in Jesus. It's important to make that distinction. It's a bit like when I was making very heavy weather of going out with Tess, who is now my wife. I should have asked her to marry me long, long before I actually did. But like many men, I was incompetent. And when Tess listens to this on Clayton TV, she will sit there with her cup of tea saying, was? <laughs> and during that time, a lot of friends gave a lot of help. And I still have an email from one of them which says this. I've decided that the best thing I can do is to write down for you all the reasons why I think marriage will be good for you and why Tess will be a great wife. And it was massively helpful, but it didn't argue me into proposing. I agreed with all the reasons, but getting married is not just the sort of the QED end of a line of reasoning. It goes way beyond reasons because it is a commitment to another person and a trusting of another person. And no one can argue you into that. And it's just the same with God. You can give, you can give all the reasons. Read the booklet, read the books, do the courses. At the end of the day, it goes way beyond reason. It is about committing yourself to Jesus as Lord, and it's about trusting him for forgiveness and then for everything else in life. And no one can argue you into that kind of step. Which is why in this church, we want to give people space to look into the Christian message, to read about it, think about it, talk about it, question, doubt, make their minds up, and avoid all pressure in that process. Last lesson, number three. We should expect a mixed response, including unreason and attack. Look on to verse five. But the Jews, that's not all of them, but, but the, uh, the, the, the leading Jews, the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. And back in chapter 14, a similar whipped-up crowd had tried to kill Paul, which I take it is what the Jews were hoping for here. Now, you would hardly call that a rational response, would you? This is not counter-argument. This is counter-attack. This is not trying to answer the gospel. This is trying to silence the gospel. And it's typical a lot of, of a lot of the irrationality in our culture today. What is going on under the surface here? The crucial word is that little word jealous in verse 5. The literal word is zealous. It means being zealous for your particular position and group. And that shades into jealousy in the sense of protectiveness and hostility to anything that criticizes you or calls your position or group into question. And harsh as it sounds, the difference between Paul and these Jews is that Paul was committed to the truth of the matter, whereas these Jews were committed to their position and their group, the belief that their Jewishness and their difference from the Gentiles meant that they were already okay with God. And anything that challenged that was to be suppressed rather than given a fair hearing. And that's so up to date, isn't it? It's so modern. For example, a few years back, some of us uh, from here were giving out literature on the Newcastle campus with the university's permission. And we were suddenly surrounded by a whole group of people from the lesbian, gay, and bisexual uh, society who physically stopped us from giving anything else out and reported us to the university authorities. So I had to go with some of them to meet with the university registrar. And at one point, one of the LGB guys said, look, we don't want you on campus any more than you want us on campus. And he was totally floored when I said to him, but I do want you on campus. And he said, but if you disagree with our position, surely you don't want us to have a voice. And I said no, because the difference between you and me is I believe in truth. And I therefore believe in freedom of speech so that the truth can make its own way in the public marketplace of ideas. And he just couldn't handle that. He just had a position and a group to defend. And he was prepared to suppress anything that criticized or questioned that group and that position. 
And what's going on under the surface whenever the gospel is spoken is that the risen Lord Jesus is challenging people's most dearly held position. He's challenging two things always. Number one, what people are trusting in. So as with these Jews in Acts chapter 17, Jesus is challenging that. He says, all your efforts to be good and religious, they don't make you any more acceptable to God. My death on the cross alone will do that. And we do not like hearing that. It strikes at our pride. He challenges what people are trusting in. The other thing, he challenges the way that we are living. So he says, I'm calling on you to let me be Lord of your life and to show you everything that is wrong with it and to start putting it right. And we don't like hearing that either because it strikes at our independence. And that is why back then and today there is this response of unreason and attack. Read on verse 6. But when they didn't find Paul and Silas, in other words, when plan A, the lynch mob killing, failed, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials shouting, these men who've caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason's welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decree, saying there's another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. So... Plan B was to use the law of the land against them by misrepresenting their message as treason and them as a threat to peace and order. And again, that's so up to date, so modern. Right now, uh, there are attempts in this country to use public order laws against evangelism, misrepresenting Christians as a threat to peace and order because we are intolerant, um, uh, in, inciting hatred, uh, and so on. But we're not. As those words of Jesus on the outline remind us, Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, which includes living peacefully under Caesar's laws. Now, having said that, of course, Christians do have a higher ultimate allegiance so that if the laws are trying to silence the gospel, the right response is the one we saw back in Acts 4, down there on the outline. Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I wish I could say that more truthfully about myself. I never read that book that I mentioned at the start, Explaining Your Faith Without Losing Your Friends. I'm sure it said some helpful things, but the most helpful thing is the realism of the Bible, isn't it? Which says, I might lose some friends, and I might make some enemies. But if so, reading what Paul had to go through for the gospel and what Jesus had to go through so that there could be a gospel puts that into perspective. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, for each of us here yet to believe in you, but wistful, and thinking, please draw us to that point of commitment and trust which reason alone cannot get us to. And for each of us who does believe in you, please give us a greater conviction of the truthfulness of the gospel, a greater ability to explain it and answer for it, and perhaps above all, a greater willingness to suffer for it when we have to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.